Pardon.
गुड मॉर्निंग वार्म वेलकम टू द सेकंड डे ऑफ द सिक्स्थ इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन एडवांसेस इन मटेरियल साइंस इट इज ऑलरेडी वार्म एंड स्टिल आई वेलकम यू ऑल एंड वी विल स्टार्ट द टुडेज ओरल सेशन यस वी हैव मेड अ स्मॉल चेंजेस व्हिच इज वन आवर बिफोर वी आर स्टार्टिंग Uh, because of the time limit because it may go uh, more than 5:30 so uh, before 5 we have to complete uh, this conference as per schedule so uh, 10 oral presentations we are taking uh, from 9 to 10 and after 10 um, we are starting our um, scheduled uh, session okay so uh, i welcome uh, dr vasist gurme sir uh, who is the examiner of the oral session uh, sir uh, welcome sir uh, gurme sir and uh, uh, i ask uh, mr rajaram sutar sir uh, to start the oral session so over to you sutar sir thank you good morning all of you Uh, 56 and 57 uh, all are uh, absent so i will start uh, op number 58 this is the oral presentation number op number 58 Camps 2021 on the topic of electrical and dielectrical study of cadmium doped cobalt nickel ferrites synthesized by solid state reaction method. Material classically classified in the uh, category of material science and uh, having particularly ferrites are having a particular chemical formula. Uh, I am Akshay Kulkarni uh, presenting my oral presentation for I Camps 2021 on the topic of electrical and dielectrical. Study of cadmium doped cobalt nickel ferrites synthesized by solid state reaction method. Material basically classified in the uh, category of material science, and uh, having particularly ferrites are having a particular chemical formula of Eb two O four. Ferrite materials basically come under the classification of magnetic materials. Uh, as we know, third used for synthesis of ferrite materials are the solid state reaction method. In the solid state reaction method, uh, initially we are taking. Uh, all the chemicals uh, and uh, put them in the uh, mortar uh, using a pestle continuously for 4 hours we uh, thoroughly mix it after a homogeneous mixture thoroughly grinded it will put inside a, a muffle furnace for 4 uh, hours at a temperature of 800 degrees centigrade after taking out we are getting the magnetic uh, ferrite materials Uh, we synthesized uh, cadmium doped uh, cobalt uh, nickel ferrites uh, initially we took the xrd plot of all the synthesized sample and uh, uh, this is the uh, representation of those all the uh, xrd graphs so uh, xrd after analysis of xrd pattern we found that the lattice parameter is lying in the range of 8.34 to 8.36 uh, as per literature this is matching with the uh, other cobalt nickel ferrite samples the same images of these samples have been taken and uh, as we can see the crystal uh, the grain size is larger for a, a lower value of x as we go on increasing doping the grain size decreases that means the doping has a very prominent effect on the morphology the grain size decreases whereas agglomeration that is attachment of my, uh, one one grain with other has gone increasing electric studies uh, have been carried out for all the samples it shows that initially the dielectric constant observed for, to be very high as the frequency gone increasing the dielectric constant gone decreasing the reason for this is uh, dispersion behavior where for initial uh, frequency the atoms and molecule can respond to the applied frequency as the frequency increases 
the molecules cannot uh, follow the applied frequency variation hence uh, their contribution go on reducing and at the end only electronic contribution remains hence it has gone decreasing but uh, one more thing observed is as the cadmium concentration go on increasing the uh, the dielectric constant value has increased the dielectric loss graph is plotted for the same series and we can see that uh, except x equal to 0.1 all other samples have shown a very low dielectric loss and for a very higher uh, value of the uh, frequency the dielectric loss is almost observed to be zero ac conductivity study is also carried out uh, we have seen that as the frequency increase the ac conductivity of the samples go on increasing and as the can, uh, cadmium concentration also as it increases the conductivity is observed to be increasing we try to plot the cole cole plot uh, the cole cole plots are uh, uh, done to understand the contribution of uh, grains and grain boundaries in the ac conductivity doping increases the uh, grain boundary contribution to the ac conductivity the dc electrical uh, resistivity studies have, have been carried out and uh, this is the uh, plot uh, uh, which is uh, the log of conductivity uh, resistivity versus one upon temperature have been plotted for all the samples it is observed to be a straight line all samples uh, shown mm -hmm. a straight line of uh, resistivity versus uh, one upon temperature this confirms the semiconducting nature of all the samples and using this uh, straight line uh, we try to calculate the activation energy and uh, the variation is uh, 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 studied from a temperature room temperature till 700 degree centigrade and we try to even uh, calculate the curie temperature where there is a ch phase change between uh, para ferrimagnetic para ferrimagnetic to uh, paramagnetic material and these are the values of activation energy curie temperature and resistivity overall conclusions from this presentation is the bragg reflections observed from xrd plot confirm the formation of cubic spinner structure the grain size uh, decreased in uh, cobalt nickel ferrites and porous nature is observed in uh, sm images the dielectric studies show an exponential decrease with increase in frequency and cadmium concentration for the series the ac conductivity increases linearly with increase in frequency and cadmium concentration for all the samples the electric property studies that is dc resistivity exhibit semiconducting nature for all the samples Thank you, Kulkarni sir. Uh, in the chat box, uh, there are no any questions. Then I will go to uh, OP number 59. So I will screen, uh, share the screen. Good morning to all myself, Dr. This is oral presentation number OP59. Good morning to all. Myself, Dr. J. V. Dhanmej from Srimati P. K. Kuteja Maila Mahavidyalaya Musawar, which is affiliated to North Maharashtra University, Jalgaon. My topic is electrical and optical properties of CDT thin frames by closed space sublimation technique. Introduction. Heterostructure of Second, sixth compound semiconductor exhibiting wide band gap are extensively studied for optoelectronics applications. The electrical and optical properties of semiconducting flames are essential requirement for proper application in optoelectronics devices. And these properties are very sensitive to deposition conditions and technique use. A systematic study of the electrical and optical properties of CDT thin flames are studied in this paper. Experimental metal preparation. The bulk sample of CDT has been prepared by melt quench method. The direct mixture of extremely pure CD and T in accordance with their atomic ratio was kept back in evacuated pots and pool at pressure 10 raised to minus 5 torr. The ampoule was heated at temperature about 940 degrees Celsius for 10 hours. Then ampoule is quenched in high school water. 
the CDT invert was taken out from the ampoule and made into fine powder and used for uh, film preparation. Characterization of sample. Transmission spectra were obtained in the wavelength range of 200 nanometer to 1100 nanometer. Resistivity of the samples was measured by four probe techniques. A small oven had been provided to facilitate measurements at various temperatures ranging from room temperature 303 Kelvin to 473 Kelvin. All measurement also done using scientific equipment uh, uh, Rurki and uh, thermoelectric power also uh, measured from the scientific equipment is to it. From the experiment, electrical resistivity and activity, activation energy uh, is calculated. So it is found that resistivity and activ activation energy is thickness dependent. So activation energy increases as thickness of the flame increases. So Hall effect also estimated Hall mobility, Hall coefficient and carrier concentrations are thickness dependent. Carrier concentration decreases as thickness of the flame increases. So TEP measurements is also done. From TEP measurements, Fermi energy and absorption coefficient were calculated. Band gap of the material is also uh, find out. So uh, it is it is found that 1.6 to 2.2 electron hold, which is in good agreement with the earlier investigation. So it is seen that as temperature and flame is increases, the resistivity decreases. It suggests that semiconducting nature of material. Activation energy is also determined whose values lie between 0 0.24 electron volt to 0 0.26 electron volt and it is found to be thickness dependent. The Hall measurement of CDT flames indicate that Hall mobility, Hall coefficient and carrier concentrations are thickness dependent and the deposited flames are of P-type semiconducting in nature. Thermoelectric power is measured by integral method from which Fermi energy and absorption uh, coefficients were calculated. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There is no any questions in the chat box. So I will go to uh, next oral. Next oral presentation is OP number uh, 60. So I scare, share the screen of oral presentation number OP 60. Good morning to one and all. Myself, Dr. N.S. Vadakkar. I am here to present a research work entitled Investigating the Complex Optical Properties of Thiopine indole conducting copolymers as optoelectronic devices. This is the outline of the presentation. Uh, introduction <coughs> uh, Conjugated conducting polymers are significant materials and that find a lot of apl potential application in various uh, areas like organic solar cell, sensor, LEDs, uh, heads. Uh, non-linear optical devices etc the conjugated conducting polymers and their copolymers exhibit sufficient high optoelectronics properties such materials are usually <coughs> offer in low cost electronics and optical devices and here we have synthesized the uh, thiopine indole conducting copolymers uh, uh, in aqueous solution in order to study the optical properties of such materials then experimental details the thiopine indole monomers anhydrous uh, iron chlorides uh, h2o2 uh, these uh, chemicals are of ar grades uh, grade and here we have synthesized the thiopine indole conducting copolymer uh, 
by uh, chemical oxidative copolymerization uh, method uh, in aqueous solution <coughs> result and discussion the xrd pattern of the synthesized material is as shown in the figure the bro uh, the pattern shows the broad hump between 2 to 20 to 30 degree which pointed out the amorphous nature of the synthesized material then is epicem the um, micrograph of thiopinindole conducting copolymer is as shown in the figure the micrograph represent extremely rough microglobular porous structure and the surface particles are inhomogeneous in nature which attribute to randomness in the structure of the synthesized material then optical study the uv absorption spectra for thiopinindole conducting copolymer in the range 200 to 800 nanometer is as shown in the figure the highly intense absorption peak of the synthesized sample was observed at 280 nanometer <coughs> then the figure depicts the optical band gap curve for this studied sample and uh, the band gap is found to be 2.52 and 2.67 electron volt for uh, the prepared um, copolymers respectively uh, the uh, the values concluded that the prepared uh, samples have potential application in optoelectronic uh, devices. Uh, the plot for the optical conductivity as a function of wavelength is as shown in the figure. The values of optical conductivity for the samples of thiopinindole conducting copolymer are estimated as 1.08 into 10 raised to 7 and 1.12 into 10 raised to 7 cmn per centimeter at 280 nanometer respectively finally the conclusion the uh, we have syn here synthesized the thiopinindole conducting copolymer co in aqueous solution successfully and we have studied the uh, complex optical um, parameters of the uh, studied samples <coughs> the optical band gap values were found to be uh, in the range 2.52 and 2.67 electron volt uh, of the prepared copolymeric material, the estimated optical band gap values um, <coughs> accepted value for photovoltaic activities and has potential for application in solar cell and devices. These are some references uh, in my uh, research work and finally thank you very much. Thank you sir. There are no any questions uh, in the chat box. So next oral uh, presentation is OP number 61. So I share the oral presentation number 61. Good evening, myself Dr. Santoshi Kadapore. I am going to present on bio smart metal in cell filling of a concrete. I will start with introduction. As you all know, concrete is a common construction metal and it is termed as a non sustainable concrete because of use of cement as a basic raw metal and due to cracks in concrete. Recently, novel technique has been reported based on the process of bio mineralization to heal cracks in concrete. Bio mineralization is a process which involves precipitation of calcium carbonate by microorganisms. This is a pictorial representation of bio process taking place in concrete. In A, you can see at the initial stage of bio process. In B, there are some calcite particles surrounding bacterial cell. And in C, bacterial cell is completely surrounded by calcite particles. The aim of the research is to study the microbial effect on repairing cracks in flash concrete and to confirm the precipitation of calcite particles in concrete by SCM analysis. Coming to metal methods, the initial part of the work is the selection of bacteria. To select bacteria, pH is an important factor 
so experimental studies have been conducted to study the growth of microbes at various ph and what you can see the selected bacteria is able to survive at a different ph from 8.5 to 11 the selected bacteria is bacillus spiricus strain Synthesis of microbial solution. Microbial solution is a mixture of a bacterial solution of concentration 10 to the power of 5 cells per ml, cells per ml plus cement, sand and water. Concrete cubes of size 150 mm into 150 mm into 150 mm is prepared for testing compressive strength and water absorption property. Artificial cracks were created of particular size, particular width and depth to study the effectiveness of bio-based agent in healing cracks in concrete. So here two types of agents are prepared. One is a bio-based agent which consists of bacterial solution, cement, sand and water and another one is a cement, sand and water. Coming to compressive strength of bio-repaired concrete. Now what you can see here, the compressive strength of bio-repaired concrete at 14 and 28 days is greater than compressive strength of non bio repaired concrete at 14 and 28 days strength has found to be increased by around 10 percent for bio repaired concrete next about water absorption water absorption of bio repaired concrete is found to be lower compared to that of water absorption of uh, non bio repaired concrete so optimum is found to be 6.3 for concrete containing flash of 10 percent SCM analysis done to confirm the precipitation of calcite in a concrete. Now what you can see here white layer. You can see here the white layer. These are nothing but calcite particles. So presence of calcite particles due to biological process increase the strength and durability property. This fills the opening space or cracks in the concrete. Now this is this calcite particles is absent in a non bio repaired concrete. Coming to conclusion, this research work, work uh, confirmed that bioemulsion process can be used effectively in repairing cracks in concrete. Thank you, sir. There are no any questions in the chat box. Next uh, oral presentation is OP number 62. Is a uh, OP number 62. Welcome. Myself, Dr. Sachin B. Bangare, working as an assistant professor, Department of Chemistry, GM Mehta College of Science, Tala. Now I am here. The uh, my research paper presentations, uh, ne, the number of the my uh, oral presentation 62. The name of the my research uh, were synthesis characterization and gas sensing studies of nickel oxide thin film sensor towards the ethanol, acetone, ammonia, and carbon dioxide which will be present on 6th International Conference on Advanced in Material Science uh, which is organized by Post-Graduation Department of Physics, Rajay Ramadha Mahavidyalaya Outline of my research were Firstly, introductions, objective of my work, experimental method, result and discussion, lastly, conclusion uh, These are the basic introductions of my research over here, the semiconducting metal oxides uh, such as zinc oxide, tin oxide, and tungsten oxide, nickel oxides have been widely studied for their gas sensing application. Uh, nickel oxide is a wide, wide band gap P type of semiconductor with good electrical, optical, and magnetic properties, as well as excellent chemical and thermal stability. High nickel uh, uh, metal powder is a key component of many different materials that is used for society in many different industries to manufacture a wide range of and use uh, products such as catalysis, magnetic device, powder metallurgical compo components, and gas sensing. Presently, the atmospheric pollution has become a global issue. Uh, the gas forms of auto and industrial 
is now circulating the environment. The need to detect the major and control these gases has led to research and development of the wide variety of sensors using different material and techniques. The basic uh, introduction about the nickel oxide is a p-type antiferrokinetic oxide semiconductor with wide band graph. 3.60 to 4.0 electron volts transition metal oxide conduction band energy of 2.8 electron volts and the ionization potential is 10.7 electron volt. The objective of my research was synthesis of nickel oxides and uh, preparations of the film. Structural uh, study of nickel oxide nanostructure by using X-ray refractions. Determinations of the grain size, lattice parameter, and strain, and study on gas sensing application. Uh, so many methods you can prepare by the nickel oxides here the chemical deposition, vapor phase synthesis, hydrothermal synthesis, soldier techniques, sonochemical techniques, microemulsion techniques, wet chemical techniques, co precipitation technique, and lastly, combustion technique. And here I will prepare the, this material by using the combustion uh, technique, experimental part here. The, there are the nickel oxides and glycine used in the stoichiometric amount by using the paric dish, magnetic stirring and drying at 70 to 80 degrees centigrade. So it is formed. This soil is further heated at 170 to 180 degrees centigrade by ignition in here. This nanoporous nickel oxide powder is formed. And here are the characterizations by using this nickel oxide powder by using XRD. These are the uh, my XRD data is a clear uh, curved uh, size that the grain size was calculated by using shutter formula D.9 nanometer for theta, the crystalline size was found to be 20 nanometer. Then the, the, the morphological studies by using the transmission electron analysis, the image showed distance nanoparticle for nearly spherical structure that are correlated with the XRD performance. Uh, confirm that value of nickel oxide nanoparticle with measurement of 20 to 450 nanometer which from a bead types of oriental agglomerations in the found in the transmission electron microscopic region. Uh, then gas sensing properties of this material uh, the, the uh, graph is uh, the variability of the 800 parts per million gas response as a feature of the operating temperature is depicted. It was established that the nickel oxide sensor is a temperature dependent gas sensor evaluated from uh, it has been uh, that the, the better response to the ammonia gas at 200 degrees centigrade, then uh, acetone at 200 degrees centigrade, ethanol at 225 degrees centigrade, and carbon dioxide at 225 degrees centigrade. Then selectivity of the nickel oxide sensor here in this uh, uh, graphs indicate that the nickel oxide sensor at 800 parts per million at ammonia, acetone, ethanol, and carbon dioxide gas. The net nickel oxide, the selectivity was tested throughout the presence of ammonia, acetone, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. Nickel oxide is a selective to the ammonia. The high response of the sensor to the ammonia is a response to the acetone, ethanol, and carbon dioxide gases. Uh, uh, these are the figures indicate that. With the figure and the response and recovery times of the sensor, the nickel oxide sensor response to 800 parts per million. Ammonia was found to be faster, uh, 30 seconds, and the recovery rate of this uh, sensor is 200 seconds. The rapid response and due to the gas oxide more quickly. Since the surface reaction produced the, is small and uh, adds to high volatility, volatility is a response quickly and back to the original chemical state quickly. The conclusions of the my research work the self combustion has been used to make. Nanocrystalline nickel oxide. The metal or synthesis can also be used to produce other metal oxide. Nickel oxide outperforms all the additive in the terms of supporting the ammonia gas sensing mechanism. Nickel oxide found to be the best with the best response of the ammonia gas at 200 degrees centigrade. With exposed to the ammonia gas, the sensor quickly responds and recovery quickly. Uh, Gain in the substitution, the sensor has good selectivity to the ammonia against ethanol acetone and ammonia. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bangale, sir. Hello. Bangale, sir. Uh, Hello. Latte, sir. Hello. One minute, sir. Uh, 
I am unmuting uh, to Bangladesh, sir. Bangladesh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, have you calculated EFWHM uh, for uh, these uh, nickel complexes? Hello. One minute, sir. The, this uh, is muted again. Okay. Bangladesh, sir. So, hello. Uh, please answer. Uh, hello. Bangladesh, sir. Ah, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, have you calculated hello? FWHM for these nickel complexes? Hello. Have you calculated FWHM? Let me, sir. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible, but uh, uh, Bengali sir is not. Uh, okay, no uh, problem. Okay. Uh, there was. I'm not audible, sir. Please. Uh, Bengali sir, uh, you are audible. I'm not audible, sir. Okay, okay. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Gurme, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, please ask the question in the chat box so that I will uh, repeat it to uh, Bangalore, sir. Uh, it yes, will be more uh, feasible, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah. please, please. Because unmuting and muting, uh, it will again uh, create some uh, chaos and uh, it will. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, please, uh, chat. Uh, chat uh, uh, keep your question in the chat box, please. Yes, yes. Uh, Bangladesh, sir, uh, you have one question. Uh, have you determined the FWHM? Hello, sir. Uh, sir, there is no any response. Okay, let us continue. But uh, there was big uh, background sound during his presentation. Uh, either at uh, our end or that end. Video. It should be avoided. Video, video end. It is from their end, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. But let us continue. Okay, sir. Uh, next oral presentation number is OP 63. So I will share uh, the screen of OP 63. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Vijay S. Uh, Riker. I'm from Geomedical College of Science, Chara, Raigad. So today I'm representing uh, the, my paper on growth of uh, ZNO nanowires and nano tetrapods for gas sensing at that uh, heating plate. So heating plate, uh, the temperature is controlled with the temperature controller, the electrical resistance and voltage has been provided to the film at 2000 multimeter. And this is simple to probe DC measurement technique for electrical resistance. Measurement of sensitivity, we know that the simple formula that the RG is the uh, sensitivity for the gas and you know, second one R is for the air. The percentage is the ratio to sensitivity. Is measured with this uh, formula. Then we have this uh, surface morphology of uh, 
Uh, for the characterization, what is surface morphology found? So it shows that ACM micrographs of uh, samples, both samples. So one can see that growth of uniform and densely packed zinc oxide nano rods with diameter around 100 to 150 nanometer and length 0.5 to 1 micrometer. Figure also shows zinc oxide nanoparticles over uniform and densely packed structure. So this is the morphology of the structure. Now coming to the gas sensing. So we have to first understand the effect of temperature or the sensitivity of the films. We have two prepared films over the temperature range from ambient 25 degrees Celsius to 425 degrees Celsius. Three different concentrations we have used that is 0.2 volume percent, 0.32 volume percent and 0.4 volume percent of LPG. Now this is due to the oxygen vacancies on metal oxide surfaces which are electrically and chemically. Active. These vacancies uh, function and type donors and often significantly increase the conductivity of oxides. So observation shows that for LPG, the sensor response reaches the maximum value at 385 degrees Celsius temperature for film F1, while F2, the maximum value lies in the range of 280 degrees Celsius to 345 degrees Celsius. Similar behavior has been reported uh, by the uh, other, uh, other authors. Okay, this is given sensing now surface recovery analysis uh, is also being studied for these uh, two samples <clears throat> so the figure shows that sensor sensitivity for lpg and oxygen with time at peak temperature for films respectively the sensor sensitivity for films f1 and f2 during exposure 0.4 percent lpg in airtight chamber therefore recovery rate was observed at fixed temperature 100 degrees celsius 150 and 200 and 300 degrees celsius the sensor sensitivity both samples decreases with time in presence of lpg due to the desorption process so after 30 minutes the recovery time was checked uh, by the exposure time and recovery of the resistance when target gas is removed which determines both oxygen and redox substance from the ambient on the surface and with reoxidation of the oxides. So, in the conclusion, moving to the conclusion, final part, uniform area has been uh, synthesized about um, this one, which length 0.51 micrometer general on nano rods and nano polypod pods, with pod diameter around 150 nanometer. The chemical synthesis has been used, the uh, use of trial is combined, we have used as capping agent, but the uh, structure has been formed. Okay. Now, what we have found that the sensor response increases with temperature for both LPG, while with the increase in gas concentration from 0.2 to 0.4 volume percent. The response was found to be linear with the increase in gas concentration and the sensor sensing and the recovery time analysis shows that the recovery time reduces with the increase in the operation temperature for both the gasmic. The recovery time of both samples has been found to be uh, least at the temperature of 250 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is our gas sensing research. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sir, there was one question in chat box. How yes, you but uh, Riker sir is not uh, present here, sir. Riker sir is not oh. present here, so I will continue next oral. So next uh, oral pay presentation. Is OP sixty four. Next oral presentation number is uh, OP sixty four. I am Dr. Vanita Raut. My oral presentation number is sixty four. Respected referees, organizers, and virtual participants. First of all, at the outset, I would like to thank organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my research work in this international conference. The topic of my presentation is fossil synthesis and characterization of indium doped CDC thin films for PC solar cell. 
the plan of presentation is introduction and uh, then synthesis part third part it includes effect of indium doping on various physical properties and pc properties and lastly the conclusions firstly the introduction from last several decades energy crisis issue forces mankind to make use of renewable energy sources solar energy is one of the best alternative the problem is only how to harness it so photovoltaic conversion is one of the promising method there are in thus our intention of this work is to synthesize economical and high performance solar cell as cds is one of the most potential candidate so it is chosen and from the literature review we have chosen indium as a dopant doping way we have chosen to improve the pc performance chemical by deposition method we have chosen from the literature review part second that is considering the synthesis of cdsc and indium dop cdsc thin film by cbd method here the figure one shows schematic of experimental setup used for the deposition while the advantages of cbd method are also listed over here for chemical synthesis of cdsc thin film various preparative parameters as precursor concentration ph temperature deposition time are optimized using pc method and in order to get best photosensitive thin film pc method is used here the table shows the optimized preparative parameters for synthesis of thin film deposition mecha mechanism is explained as by the equations synthesis of indium doped cdc thin films the corresponding optimized preparative parameters are listed in the table the optimized dopant volumetric doping percentage is 0.2 volume percent part third we are going to discuss here is studies on effect of doping on physical properties and pc properties firstly the structural properties they are studied using xrd technique xrd patterns are shown over here the observed xrd patterns matches well with standard jcps data card number 00019 0191 Five diffraction peaks observed, confirming the formation of CDC thin film. While for the indium doped CDC thin film, that is the red curve, here one more peak observed, close to two theta value, twenty four point three degree, is indexed as one zero zero plane of Woodside hexagonal plane, confirming the phase change. And modest improvement in crystallinity is observed subsequent to the indium doping. The FSM images of undoped CDSC and doped CDSC thin film at two different magnifications, as 5 kx and 10 kx, are shown over here. Undoped CDSC shows cauliflower-like structure, which may be because of agglomeration and coalescence of small spherical grains. Indium incorporation causes variation in morphology, as elliptical-shaped elongated grains for doped CDSC sample are shown, as in figure 4b. B dash. It acts pattern and concern uh, percentage of indium, selenium, and C D are shown in the table. For estimation of band gap energy, optical study was recorded. Here, uh, plots of alpha h nu square versus h nu are uh, shown. The linear nature of plot specifies presence of direct transition. Estimated band gap for pure CDSC is 2.18 electron volt. After doping, it is found to be decreased to 1.91 electron volt, which may be due to the creation of indium donor levels near conduction band in the band gap region. Water contact angle values are also given. They shows that uh, they are decreased from 73.5 degree to 58.8 degree. Smaller contact angle means more hydrophilic nature here this figure shows typical pc solar cell setup while figure b and c shows pc cell setup that i have used figure 8 shows power output characteristic in dark and under illumination for undoped cdsc and indium doped cdsc thin films in dark condition pc cell shows very small dark current under illumination condition open circuit voltage increases with negative polarity which shows that films have n type of conductivity here the table shows pc solar cell parameters for both electrodes 
JSN VOC values are 1.21 and 432 for CDSC photo anode and after indium doping these values are found to be enhanced to 1.79 milliampere per centimeter square and 464 millivolt respectively. The PC cell performance was found to be improved with indium doping. The efficiency and fill factor were modified from 0.54 to 0.79 and 52.3 to 47. The indium dope, indium dope CDSC thin film shows superior performance than pure CDSC, which may be the effect of creation of indium donor levels in CDSC lattice. This, decrease, this decreases span gap in the doped film, which further permits the utilization of more and more portion of solar cell spectrum which could be responsible for superior PEC performance. Here, finally the conclusions, briefly I would like to say that indium doping in CDSC is found favorable for use in PEC solar cell and it provides a new choice for developing solar cell. I would like to acknowledge my research guide, Honorable Kiledar sir, co-guide Lokhande sir and UGC and all this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. In the chat box, Akshay Kulkarni asking you. Uh, yes. Raut, madam. Yes, yes. Ad additional peaks uh, is may be due to phase change. Uh, yes, there is a phase change from cubic phase to hexagonal phase because of that. Uh, but yes. improvement in the crystallinity is because of indium. Okay. Then Gurmeet sir is asking you why indium selected? Uh, because indium adds donor level. In the uh, in the band gap region near conduction band, and because of the, that donor levels, the band gap decreases, and uh, this decreased band gap will increase the optical absorption, which is useful in order to absorb more spec uh, more photons from the solar spectrum region. Therefore, India has chosen. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so I will continue to next uh, oral. The next oral presentation is uh, OP65. So I will scare, uh, share the screen of uh, OP65. Good afternoon to all of you. Now I want to discuss about the analysis of optical fiber network, which is based on EDFA optical fiber uh, amplifier, and it is uh, based on DWDM technology. And in this paper, in this work, we want to discuss and elaborate the value of extension ratio in the performance of optical fiber communication system. Actually, the optical fiber network is the backbone of fifth generation optical fiber communication system. So, the performance is calculated of the system on the basis of quality factor and bit error rate. Now, the role of extension ratio cannot be neglected because by the variation of fiber length, that is in the case of single mode fiber, the long haul communication, it is uh, most important to give focus on the extension risk. So in this case, we give focus, we investigate the role of extension risk in the fiber optic network, how it uh, affects to the system. 
actually the performance of the system optical that is optical fiber network depends upon the non linearity linearity and leakage of the signal well leakage of the signal is related to the extension ratio so first of all in the given work which is made by the dwdm based technology and edfa amplifier with uh, dcf dispersion uh, compensation fiber and then here we want to show the asymmetrical selection of the input power in the transmission system the cross phase modulation is suppressed that is it can behaves as the treatment of non linearity whereas whereas the extension ratio is explained important as and when the length of the fiber is changed suppose two when the length of the fiber is uh, 50 km then its quality factor is high approximately 11 units whereas in the case of uh, diagram number 3 uh, the length of the fiber is uh, 100 km so quality factor decreases and finally it is shown in the i diagram where the distortion becomes high so on the basis of table 2 it is clear it gives a higher quality factor whereas in the table 3 we get to the slightly lower uh, value of quality factor so finally i want to say extension ratio is the function of fiber length thank you thank you sir good afternoon to all of you you know any questions in the chat box so due to uh, time limit uh, op number 66 and 67 we continue in afternoon oral session so at uh, sharp 10 am uh, uh, uh welcome uh, all of you for the uh, this is the actually it was the first session but uh, for some reason um, we had to uh, put some session oral session uh, in the morning session 9 to 10 now we are going to us the first um, the second session uh, which is the invited talk session so i welcome uh, uh, professor kazu nakata sense uh, i ask him to unmute and uh, yeah uh, hi nakata sense how are you hi hi <laughs> hello <laughs> nice to see you once again yeah after, yeah, uh, yeah long time yeah. long um, time to see you so i i'm here uh, first uh, first of all uh, i will just introduce uh, professor kazu nakata sense So, uh, Professor Kazuya Nakata um, is currently an associate professor at Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, Japan. He received his PhD in 2005 uh, 
from Tokyo Metropolitan University, Japan. In 2005, he joined Tohoku University as a research fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, JSPS, and then he joined the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2006 as a JSPS fellow. He has been a full-time researcher at the Kanagawa Academy of Science and Technology, CAST, since 2007, and then associate professor at the Tokyo University of Science since 2013. In April 2019, he has been an current position at Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, Japan. So he received many awards. So he received Sano Award for Young Scientist from the Electrochemical Society of Japan in 2012. The Japanese Photochemistry Association Prize for Young Scientist in 2013. Green Sustainable Chemistry Award for Young Scientist in 2016. So he got many prestigious awards. And his research interests are mainly in photofunctional materials. So with this uh, brief introduction, uh, I, I um, request Professor Kazuya Nakada-sensei uh, to deliver his uh, invited talk. Uh, I'm very happy to have my sensei uh, over here. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for joining. Yeah, please, please share your... Uh, okay, okay. I want to share my slide. I'm not getting your voice, sir. I'm not getting your voice. So, I'm not getting you... Hmm? Can I... Hello. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, I'm hearing you. Yeah, um, I, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, it was a little mistake. Uh, I just uh, once again um, uh, um, uh, go for your CV. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, this is a, a mistake from my end. Sorry. Uh, so, I, I will briefly introduce uh, today's uh, invited talk uh, 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 speaker. Uh, Professor Kazuya Nakata uh, is currently an associate professor at Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, Japan. Uh, he received his PhD in 2005 from Tokyo Metropolitan University. In 2005, he joined Tohoku University as a research fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, JSPS. And then he joined the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2006 as a JSPS research fellow. He has been a full-time researcher at the Kanagawa Academy of Science and Technology CAST since 2007, and then associate professor at Tokyo University of Science since 2013. In April 2019, he has been in current position. He received a Sano Award for Young Scientists from the Electrochemical Society of Japan in 2012. The Japanese Photochemistry Association Prize for a Young Scientist in 2013, Green Sustainable Chemistry Award for a Young Scientist in 2016. Uh, his uh, main research interests are photofunctional materials. Uh, he is constantly working uh, in this field, and I am very happy to have my uh, uh, sensei, uh, Professor Kazuya Nakata -san, -san, sensei. Uh, for today's talk. So I request Professor Kazuya Nakata uh, Sensei uh, to deliver his invited talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. So can I sh share my slide? Okay. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Can you see slide? It's okay. Uh, yes, uh, Sensei, it is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, sorry. 
Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sanjay San, uh, for a uh, kind uh, invitation for this conference. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Kazuya Nakata. I'm from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank again uh, Professor Sanjay uh, to give me uh, this op opportunity to join this conference. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee. Today, my title is uh, Photocatalysis for Bioreated Applications. Uh, actually, uh, we use photocatalytic reactions to produce uh, useful chemicals and also apply it uh, for uh, bioreated applications, researches. The chemicals can be produced using solar energy and uh, ambient conditions, so it is very green process. So today I'm gonna show you our recent works, which is in the boundary research field between chemistry and biology. Uh, uh, photocatalyst is a material uh, that induces uh, oxidative and reductive reactions and the light illuminations. Let's say a uh, photocatalyst particle here. If we illuminate the light, excited electron and hole are generated. Then those are moved to photocatalyst surface and they induce the reduction and oxidation reactions. Especially the oxidation reaction is useful because the oxidation reaction induces the decomposition of harmful organic compounds, which can be applied for uh, environmental, bio environmental purifications. For example, this picture shows uh, illuminations in the tunnel and the surface of the illumination getting dirty like this because of smoke from cars. But if you coat the photocatalyst, the surface keeps clean because photocatalysts oxidatively decompose an organic compound. Photocatalysts are already used for many applications. These applications are broadly divided for two application fields, environmental and energy applications. In environmental area, air purification and painting are major applications. In energy field, hydrogen, hydrogen production has much attention. By the way, uh, in application of photocatalysis in biological research field, there are many reports related to antibacterial antivirus applications. Actually, uh, photocatalysis inactivate the most of, of bacteria and virus, such as common bacteria, multidrug resistant bacteria, influenza virus, and also and, and so on. This is an advantage of photocatalyst. However, other applications of a photocatalyst in biological field are very limited because as I said, photocatalyst decompose are organic chemicals, but living, living things are composed of organic chemicals. So photocatalyst always just damage it. So we have done a perception change. As I said, photocatalysis damage the living things. But once we prepare chemical species using photocatalyst, then we apply these chemicals, these chemical species to living things. By using this strategy, living things can be activated or more inactivated than just use of photocatalyst, which is depends on the property of chemical species. So today I'd like to show you some results using this strategy. Firstly, I'd like to show you a 
improvement of germination of seeds using photocatalyst. We know a uh, seed of plants germinate after water absorption. For example, uh, seeds of plants such as wheat, carrot, corn, and, also, and so on that you daily eat has highly germinated like this. But germination of some kind of seeds are not good, such as medical plants and so on. But this type of seeds are sometimes rare and expensive. So in agriculture, in improvement of germination is very important issue. We previously demonstrated to improve the germination using photocatalysis. Method is very simple. Firstly, we put seed on the photocatalyst, then illuminate the light. After that, seeds are moved to on the wet paper, then just waiting. For control, which means this is no photocatalyst treatment, germination of seed is like this. This is not good, but after photocatalytic treatment, germination is improve, improved like this. This is drastically changes. We try to use other seeds. These figures show our germination rates for each conditions. We found some of seeds show improvement of germination rate by photocatalyst treatment. Why germination was improved? Actually, uh, germination mechanism is depends on the kind of seed, but essentially seeds of plants has this type of germination mechanism. After water absorption, the active oxygen species are generated inside the seed by enzymatic reaction. Then this the active oxygen species changes the balance of plant hormones such, such as abscisic acid and diuretic acid. Foods changes promote the dormancy release leading to the seed germination. In photocatalyst, if you use a titanium dioxide photocatalyst in air, a reactive, reactive, reactive oxygen species are generated because water in air oxidized to O8 radical and oxygen leads to superoxide anion radical. So these reactive oxygen species may affect the generation of seed. Anyway, uh, in this work, firstly, we generated the reactive oxygen species using photocatalyst. Then we apply uh, this reactive oxygen species to seeds of plants. So this reactive oxygen species induce the seed germination. I'm gonna move to uh, next topic. Some kind of spore formation bacteria cause uh, food poisoning every year and were sometimes used in biological theories. This type of bacteria forms a thick protective wall around itself and has very high durability. If we apply a boiling water to this, but this cannot be inactivated. Ethanol is a widely used uh, disinfectant. Now, sometimes you may use it to protect from coronavirus, but ethanol also cannot inactivate the spore formation bacteria. So we need to change the ethanol as a disinfectant to more, to stronger disinfectant with brief and environmentally friendly method. In our strategy, we use photocatalyst. As explained, a photocatalytic reaction promotes both oxidation and redu reduction reactions. So if we apply a uh, ethanol, we assumed this ethanol can be oxidized to form uh, acetic acid. On the other hand, oxygen 
in air is ready to form a hydrogen peroxide at some photocatalyst. So this acetic acid and hydrogen peroxide further reacted to form a peracetic acid according to this chemical reaction. The, this, oh sorry, one moment. Okay, uh, paracetic pa acid, and this, this paracetic acid has a broad antibacterial spectra, including uh, spore formation bacteria. So in this study, we examine uh, inactivation of spore formation bacteria using photocatalytic reaction in the presence of ethanol. This figure shows a uh, survival rate of spore formation bacteria. Firstly, we try to use a titan dioxide, which is a typical photocatalyst. But in each case, spore formation bacteria cannot be inactivated, even in the presence of ultraviolet light and also ethanol. Next step, we used uh, WO3 and a visible light. Interestingly, spore formation bacteria are inactivated like this in the presence of ethanol. So we checked the formation of paracetic acid using HPLC. In the case of using TRO2, we could not find the presence of paracetic acid, but in WO3, we found paracetic acid here. So this paracetic acid inactivates the spore formation bacteria. Why WO3 with the presence of ethanol generates the paracetic acid? In the case of TRO2, conduction band of TRO2 is high. So excited electron used for a one electron reduction to form a superoxide anion radical. On the other hand, conduction band of WO3 is lower. So this, so this excited electron used for two electron reduction to form a hydrogen peroxide. So this hydrogen peroxide and acetic acid after oxidation of ethanol reacted to form a paracetic acid. So in this work, we prepared a paracetic acid using photocatalytic reaction with ethanol. Then we apply it to a spore formation bacteria to inactivate. As a next topic, I'll show you a selective inactivation of microorganisms. As I talked, photocatalysis can inactivate uh, many kinds of bacteria and virus. This is, an this is an advantage of photocatalysis, but some kinds of microorganisms are useful. For example, in fermentation industry, they use uh, bacteria such as lactic acid bacteria to produce uh, food. In this industry, one of the severe problem is the presence of bacteriophage, which is a kind of virus which infects the bacteria and inactivate it. So we need, need to selectively inactivate the bacteriophage without inactivation of bacteria. Rhodium doped strontium titanate, STO rhodium is a famous photocatalyst showing uh, efficient hydrogen evolution. And also, we recently reported uh, STO rhodium decomposes uh, as the aldehyde as a volatile organic compounds and a visible light. But there is no report about antimicroorganisms effect. Recently, we found this STO rhodium showed a selective antibacteriophage effect without inactivation of bacteria. This figure shows a survival rate uh, of bacteria 
and bacterial phage versus visible light irradiation time, you can see that in the case of ST or rhodium, bacteria cannot be inactivated in this time scale, but bacterial phage was rapidly inactivated. For reference, we use a TIO, oh, sorry. We, we, we use a TIO2 as a typical photocatalyst. In this case, bacteria was inactivated, but bacterial fudge was not inactivated. These results are quite opposite. Typically, bacteria is more weak for oxidative damage than bacterial fudge. So rapid inactivation of bacteria than bacterial fudge in the case of TiO2 is a typical. So why Estiolodium showed a rapid bacterial fudge inactivation, which means selective antifudge effect. In previous work, Hashimoto and co-workers reported a new type of photocatalyst, which showed an antipathogen effect. In this material, kappa-1 ion on TL2 has significant role for antipathogen effect. So in this work, we assume rhodium ion also has significant role for antifat anti effect, but STO rhodium has mixed state of tri trivalent and tetravalent rhodium ions. And we don't know which is more effective for antifat effect. So to check this, we prepared a rhodium and antimon co-doped STO because in this material, antimon is pentaparent. So rhodium ion is fixed just a triparent. Then we checked the antifad effect using those photocatalysts. In the case of STO rhodium, as I talked, rapid inactivation of bacterial fudge, but antimon co-doped photocatalysts showed no inactivation of bacterial fudge, which means uh, antifad effect suppressed by co-doping of antimon. In this photocatalyst, rhodium ion is only trivalent. So from these results, uh, tetravalent rhodium ion has significant role for antifad effect. Now we examine more detail why tetravalent rhodium ion has antifad effect. In this work, we apply a photo elimination to STO rhodium, then active metal ion such as tetravalent rhodium ion was generated and, and it showed a selective antifad effect without the inactivation of bacteria. Finally, uh, I introduce this topic. Glucose is very important sugar because glucose can be used for a uh, bioethanol and so on. If we get the glucose from food, this is problem. So another option is from biomass because biomass is much amount on the earth and this does not cause the food problem. One of the options to get the glucose from biomass is using enzyme. Enzyme is a very good option to get glucose, but some enzyme is still expensive from the viewpoint of industry. So in this work, we use photocatalyst. As I mentioned, a photocatalyst decompose our own chemicals. So we decompose our own biomass to get glucose and other useful sugars using photocatalyst. I just wanted to show you one result. In this case, we try to decompose our cerebrals. After photocatalytic treatment, 
this is HPLC chromatogram, and we found the peak of cerebios here decreased, which means uh, cerebios decomposed by uh, photocatalyst, photocatalysis, and new peaks are generated. Foods two peaks are assigned as a glucose and arabinose. This result is interesting because, because as I mentioned, cerebios decomposed and cerebios here and glucose are generated. We can understand why glucose is produced because photocatalysis can cut this glucoxal bonding in cerebios and produce a glucose. This is very happy because this reaction is like a, is an enzymatic reaction. But we cannot understand why arabinos is generated. So we compare a molecular structure between glucose and arabinos. And we found this red part is the uh, same in both, in both, but only blue part is different. So we assume this blue part of glucose is oxidized to oxidized and changed to this one. To prove this hypothesis, we try to decompose a uh, glucose, and we found we found arabinose is generated, as we assumed. Furthermore, we try to decompose a uh, galactose which is also rich amount in nature. And, and leak sauce was generated. By comparing, by comparing molecular structure, red part is uh, not changed, but only blue part is oxidized to oxidized, changed and oxidized. As same with the case of glucose. Anyway, by the way, one more interesting point is leak sauce because leak sauce is rare sugar. Rare sugar is a kind of sugar and uh, the amount of rare sugar is very small in nature. That's why it is very expensive. But recently, some of rare sugar has useful applications as medicine and functional food. For example, Aros, this is of course their sugar. This shows uh, inhabitation of cancer cell growth. And Xilitol has cavity protection. That's why this is used in gum. Their sugars are typically prepared by using en the enzyme, but this enzyme is also very rare in nature. So the price is expensive. That's why to produce rare sugars, new low-cost and environmentally friendly chemical method is requested. Actually, we prepare our various sugars according to this scheme. As I mentioned, um, glucose here changed to arabinose and galactose changed to lixose. And also, we can get uh, ribose and xylose, according to this scheme using photocatalyst. We then further try to decompose these sugars. Then we get uh, alestros and thrales, which are both their sugars. Interestingly, arabinose is cheap. The pr first price is thirty-five dollars per twenty-five grams. But Elisros food price is $2,100. This is very expensive, but we can get this through one step reaction from cheap sugar by using photocatalyst. Other rare sugars are also prepared. For example, El Arabinos is cheap sugar. Its price is $60, but after photocatalytic treatment, we can get the L, L, erythrose. Its food price is $230,000. This is very expensive. Anyway, uh, we are now, uh, we 
prepared uh, layer sugars by using photocatalyst. We are now trying to find a new medical applications of prepared layer sugars, such as anti-cancer medicine and food and so on. In conclusion, we prepare uh, useful, some, some useful chemical species using photocatalytic reaction and then apply it to a biological field. I hope this new strategy opens a new research field or boundary research area between chemistry and biology. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, all of members. Actually, I started a new laboratory two years ago. So especially, uh, I thank uh, new lab members. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Kazuya Nakata Sensei, for your excellent lecture on the uh, photofunctional materials uh, for the uh, uh, mostly the photofunctional materials like TiO2 uh, for the uh, germination of seeds, uh, inactivation of uh, spore forming bacteria, uh, some of the selective inactivation of uh, microorganisms, and the uh, production of uh, rare sugars. Uh, uh, th thanks uh, once again for your uh, 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 nice lecture. Uh, I have some uh, questions from the participants uh, in the chat box, so I will read it and uh, uh, yeah, I, I will uh, ask to you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Sir Satish is asking, is illumination by UV light uh, mm -hmm hazardous for person handling the experiment uh, practically at farm sorry what so he's uh, asking that uv light is uh, hazardous so yes. it is uh, used for the germination of seeds so how uh, it should be handled by the farmers actually the solar light is use uh, we can use the solar light because solar light containing the uv light I, I think it's okay. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, the UV light from the sunlight is uh, fine for this uh, farming, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the next question is asked by the Aslam Tamboli. Uh, he's asking that what type of chemical substance required for activation of seed? Chemical substances. You. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so your question is that what what chemical species is for uh, germination, right? Uh, uh, for uh, yes, germination of the seed. So. I, we think the reactive oxygen species are one of the key chemicals mm -hmm. uh, for germination because because they, uh, as I talked, uh, reactive oxygen species is uh, generated inside the seed after water absorption. Mm -hmm. This is this is not photocatalytic reaction. This is enzymatic reaction. I so. Mm. So we support the, we support the, uh, how to say, um, we support the, the uh, effect of, uh, uh, actually the, we can supply a uh, reactive oxygen species by using photocatalyst mm -hmm. to seed for a germination. I see. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so reactive yeah. oxygen species is one of the material. I see. Uh -huh. So the, the next question is, can we use organic substance containing ketones and aldehyde function as a photocatalytic activity? Yes, yes, yes. So, uh -huh. so yes. The so, ketone so, and uh, aldehydes can be used. So, sorry, uh, to, uh, co connection is not good for us. So, so sorry. I see. What, what, uh, what, 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 
I, I will read once again the question. Uh, can Sorry. we use organic substance containing mm -hmm. ketones and aldehyde function as photocatalytic activity? Oh yes, no. I think no problem. Uh -huh. Okay. No, yeah. Depends on the purpose. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, no problem. There is one more question from Dr. Kushal Mude. He is asking that laser irradiation can be useful for raising the germination. Laser. So, uh -huh. so you you, you mean the only use a laser or a laser with photocatalyst? Yeah, yeah, laser with photocatalyst. Laser with photocatalyst. Mm, yes, yeah, I. Mm, yeah. Yes, uh, oh. <laughs> laser is, uh, I think, a very strong mm -hmm. light illumination. So um, may, maybe I, I, we can we can do it, but <laughs> uh, maybe maybe it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, because for the activation of uh, TiO two, maybe the laser intensity is so high. I think. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I will take uh, one more uh, last question. Uh, so uh, Siris Kiledar is asking, how rare sugars can be used in the case of cancer treatment? Uh, uh, actually, I, I am sure, but uh, it, uh, some researcher reports, uh, the uh, arose, arose, arose is uh, one of the rare sugar. Mm -hmm. it, can suppress the growth of cancer cell. Mm -hmm. mm, so that's why mm, we can use as a medicine or a functional food or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, ha I have done with the uh, all the participants question. And uh, uh, once again, uh, I must thank you for um, uh, giving us the time from your busy schedule. And uh, Nakata Sensei, thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have the next uh, speaker. Uh, so we have the next. Uh, 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 sensei, uh, will you please uh, uh, unshare yes. the screen? Yes. Sorry. So our next invited uh, talk speaker uh, okay. uh, is present. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, our next invited uh, speaker uh, uh, is with us, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, just, a just a minute. OK. I'm making a call to him. Um, uh, we have with us um, Dr. Sung Soo Park from the South Korea. So um, briefly, I introduce uh, Dr. Sung Soo uh, Park. So Sung Soo Park is a research professor in Pusan National University, PNU, South Korea, since 2003. He received his PhD degree in 2002 in chemistry from Inje University, South Korea. Professor Park, uh, who is from Polymer Science and Engineering Department, PNU, has expertise in organic-inorganic hybrid materials, in particular, inorganic-based hybrid nanocomposites and periodic mesoporous materials, as well as functional mesoporous materials for electronic and optical properties. Professor Park is an excellent young scientist with over 100 research publications and over 20 patents. He had highly trained experiences in mesoporous materials, including mesoporous carbon and mesoporous silica in Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST, University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA, Fudan University and University of Queensland, Australia, as well as in the Pusan National University. Also, he has experiences to work with Professor Zhao, Fudan University, from uh, Professor J.I. Jink from UCLA, 
Professor Ajayan Vinu uh, from the University of Queensland, who are the most renowned scientists in the areas of the synthesis and application of mesoporous materials and functional nanomachine, respectively. So, with this short uh, introduction, uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Sang Sung Su Park. Uh, welcome, Doctor, and uh, please continue with your invited talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm hearing oh. you. Perfect. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you, everybody. Uh, I'm Sung Su Park, who has uh, just been uh, introduced. Uh, I'm from at Busan National University in uh, South Korea. Uh, today, uh, I will present. Uh, okay, just a moment. Yeah. Today, I will present on the functionalized uh, mesoporous organic silica films uh, at potential photo sensors. Uh, and uh, uh, I will talk in the following order. Uh, first, of all, what is your major process materials and uh, uh, functionalization of uh, major process materials uh, uh, and the applications of uh, major process materials. Uh, next, I will consider some studies on the rare earth metal ions topped PMO films and uh, organic dye topped uh, freestanding PMO films. <clears throat> Uh, as you know, uh, major porous materials have uh, nanopores in the range of uh, 2 to 15 nanometers. Uh, these materials have a high surface area of about 1,000 square meters per gram and uh, uniform pore size. Uh, generally, major porous materials can be synthesized uh, using TOS. Uh, tetraethyl also silicate uh, or organic polymers uh, as uh, poor wall compositions and uh, uh, surfactants uh, as a template the hydrothermal reaction and uh, uh, self-assembly process. These materials have uh, uh, various major structures of uh, cubic and hexagonal uh, symmetry. On the other hand, uh, metaphor silica uh, can be used uh, as a hard template uh, for synthesis of uh, other metaporous materials, uh, such as metaporous carbon and metaporous metal, metal oxide. Uh, since metaporous silica are inactive materials in general, uh, they are modified in the metaporous or in the frameworks using various meta uh, materials such as uh, uh, metal, metal oxide, uh, organic silica, optical material, drug, uh, biomaterials such as enzyme, uh, DNA, uh, and uh, fluid in order to increase the applicability. Uh, therefore, these mesoprosal materials have uh, potential applications in the fields of uh, catalysis, sensing, optics, uh, drug delivery, absorption, separation, and so on. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I would like to uh, talk about two main themes, uh, rare earth metal ions uh, incorporated the PM films and uh, organic dye incorporated the freestanding uh, PMO films. And first, uh, uh, layer earth metal ions uh, incorporated PMO uh, films were synthesized uh, using uh, PTES. Uh, PTES is like this, uh, uh, organic uh, groups uh, bleached between uh, silicon atoms. Anyway, yeah, anyway, using PTES as a uh, uh, silica source uh, and uh, surfactant as a template in acid condition, well, PTES is an alkoxy silicate with a like this, an ethyl group between two silicon atoms. In detail, uh, uh, transparent PMO films were synthesized uh, through a casting method using a reaction mixture uh, having following uh, molar uh, ratios. At that time, uh, europium chloride, uh, terbium chloride, uh, and uh, sodium chloride were used uh, as uh, 
rare earth metal ion sources. Uh, in first uh, uh, synthesis condition of these uh, pure PMO films were optimized uh, by various uh, molar ratios of uh, reactants. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, all PMO films had uh, major structures with uh, two dimensional hexagonal symmetry by uh, XRD technique. The following table <coughs> summarizes the XRD research of the synthesized PMO films. Among the molar ratios uh, of the reaction mixture, the value indicated in red uh, is uh, the optima optimal uh, condition. The PMO film uh, synthesized under optimized conditions had uh, major channels uh, parallel to the uh, film surface uh, and a well aligned 2D hexagonal visual structure. Uh, as you can see uh, with the TM images, the synthesized PMO films uh, have channels uh, parallel to the surface of the film and uh, a well ordered 2D hexagonal major structure with a uniform pore size of 24 angstrom. Uh, the results agree well uh, with the uh, results of the XRD patterns and uh, uh, anthosorption analysis. Uh, the left TM image uh, is an image of uh, image uh, viewed in a direction uh, perpendicular to the major channel direction. And the right TM image uh, is an image viewed in a direction uh, parallel to the major channel uh, direction. Uh, the film uh, has a very high surface area, more, uh, more than uh, 1200 square meter per gram. On the other hand, uh, uh, as the results of a very narrow pore size distributions show, uh, the films have a very uniform pore size. Uh, even after removing of the organic template in the major pores using the calcination method, the major, major structure was well maintained uh, while maintaining the cross-linked alkyl group uh, between silicon atoms in the world. Uh, this result was confirmed by uh, carbon and silicon solid state animal and the TGA analysis. Uh, the rare earth metal ions uh, incorporated the PMO films uh, exhibited different photoluminescence uh, properties with uh, uh, blue, green, uh, red color on the UV light. Uh, although uh, the ordering of the major structure was uh, slightly reduced with the increase of uh, layers uh, metal ions up to uh, 10. To synthesize the PMO films uh, maintained the 2D hexagonal major structures with a different content of uh, layer earth metal ions. As you can see uh, in photoluminescence spectra, uh, EU or TB TM incorporated the PMO films uh, show the characteristic uh, luminescence uh, uh, properties uh, like this. Uh, second, uh, freestanding and organic dye doped PMO films were synthesized under uh, acidic conditions using BTES as a silica source and uh, uh, fluoronic uh, 108 as a template. This uh, F108 uh, is uh, uh, black coupling. The dyes were uh, spirophyran and uh, uh, melaimid uh, species. Uh, dye doping was uh, done in two ways. One is uh, to obtain by treating uh, surfactant extracted PMO film 
uh, with a, a Thai solution. Uh, and the other is to synthesize using one part synthesis method in the synthesis of a pristine uh, PMO film like this. The pristine PMO films exhibited uh, well-ordered cubic major structures uh, with the IM3M uh, symmetry and the uniform film uh, thickness and the high surface area. The PMO film has a pore size of uh, 74.1 angstrom uh, with a narrow pore size distribution. Uh, Although the ordering of uh, major structure uh, was uh, slightly reduced uh, with the increasing dye content uh, up to uh, 40, the dye doped PMO composite films uh, maintained the cubic major structures. Uh, if uh, dye doped PMO films are synthesized by casting method using different amount of uh, reactant, uh, the thickness of the film uh, can be controlled with the uniform uh, thickness. In this work, the film thickness was uh, controlled from 1.6 micrometer to uh, 34.6 micrometer, and from 1.4 micrometer to uh, 38.1 micrometer, respectively. Uh, the fluorescence intensity uh, of the dye doped PMO films was uh, changed on the visible light and uh, UV light. The spherophyton and uh, melamide doped PMO composite films exhibited the changes of uh, fluorescence intensity on the visible light for a long period of time, um, over four hours. due to the interference effect of a surfactant in the major structure for the change of time molecular structure. Uh, on the other hand, the change of process intensity was uh, uh, completed within 55 minutes after incorporation of dyes into the surfactant extracted PMO films. Uh, this result is uh, because uh, unlike uh, dye-doped PMO composite films, uh, there is no surfactant uh, that uh, interferes, interferes the structural change of dye molecules. However, the spherophyton uh, doped PMO film has the smaller change of the uh, fluorescence intensity on the visible and the UV light uh, then melamide doped PMO film. Uh, this result because uh, the melocyanin structure uh, is uh, stabilized by the interaction of a Jupiter ionic uh, melocyanin with the silanol groups, SiOH groups on the PMO4 surface. On the other hand, uh, uh, the melamide doped PMO film uh, having a structure that does not uh, significantly affect the influence of uh, selenol groups has a large uh, variation range of the uh, fluorescence intensity. Uh, in conclusion, the photosensitive metal ions and the organic dye doped major process silica materials uh, have uh, high applications in the fields of uh, photosensors. Thank you for your attention. It's partially finished, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a nice uh, talk uh, given by Professor Sung uh, Soo. <clears throat> Actually, uh, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Sun Su Park has uh, uh, given a uh, invited uh, talk on the uh, functionalized mesoporous organosilica films as a potential uh, photosensors. Uh, so I'm just waiting for uh, uh, any questions from the participants in the chat box, uh, or they can uh, raise the hand uh, facilities. Uh, 
Actually, um, I'm very happy to know that you have worked with uh, Dr. Ajay and Vinu. Uh, mm. uh, I also uh, had interaction with him in the uh, conferences, international conferences, and uh, uh, he has many um, uh, expertise in mesoporous materials. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I will take one uh, first question from the audience. Uh, so, Professor. Uh, uh, Chang Sikha uh, is asking you a question, so I will just uh, read that question. How much? So his question is: How much dyes are incorporated in in general to realize the UV sensor? Mm, it uh, depends on some uh, another environment because not uh, uh, sure. It just um, depends on some uh, some separate condition and uh, some UV light intensity. Light is depends, so <laughs> I cannot say exactly how much amount uh, uh, is useful for mm -hmm. UV sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the light is some dye molecules. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Park, I have one question that um, mm -hmm. if I want to uh, coat a mesoporous silica on the glass substrate um, and uh, using the Solgel process. So mm -hmm. can you give me uh, any idea of how to coat the mesoporous silica using Solgel process uh, or taking any precursor of the Solgel process like uh, uh, TEOS? Uh, can it be done with the uh, Solgel process? Yeah, uh, instead of uh, silica sauce, uh, uh, for example, some TEOS, Mm -hmm. uh, we can use uh, like this uh, uh, titanium ethoxide and also another metal uh, alkoxide uh, uh, molecules. But mm -hmm. uh, some another transition metal alkoxide forms are not uh, stable. Not stable mm -hmm. means uh, easily uh, make some precipitation in the solution. So we cannot uh, make easily some self-assembled uh, some major structure uh, compared to uh, silica uh, source. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, we can try and also many researchers, they tried with the, another uh, metal alkoxide precursors as uh, some uh, co 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 uh, formation of the uh, world composition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it was very nice work done by you and uh, the participants have enjoyed it. Uh, so one more question is coming from Dr. Mahendra Kaure. So he's saying that I have an observation. It's my number In the slide of fluorescence spectra, the fourth graph was y-axis, named as a blue presence bottom right graph. Okay, he's saying. Uh, can can you uh, uh, check the uh, uh, chat box. So he has asked the question. Maybe I, I don't know wh what he wanted to say, but uh, he said that in the slide, the fluorescence spectra, the fourth graph was as y axis. Okay, maybe some some correction. No, no problem. So, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks once again, uh, Dr. Park, for your uh, really uh, scientific and uh, informative talk. And uh, your work is very uh, nice, and uh, the participants has uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, hope to have the uh, uh, future collaboration with you. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, we have the we have our uh, next speaker. So we we have the we we have our next speaker. Uh, I'll just. Make it clear. So, uh, Dr. Sade, uh, please un unmute, unmute yourself. So, okay. Dr. Sade, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Shivaji uh, B. Sade, uh, um, his research interests are in the nanomaterials, energy technologies, hydrogen energy production, and uh, storage, organic electronic, and lighting uh, devices. Uh, his research experiences are like uh, 
he has joined as a junior research fellowship, a senior research fellowship. Also, he got the senior research fellowship from CSIR New Delhi. Uh, he uh, completed his uh, postdoctoral uh, doctoral fellow at Group Itude La Matere. It is an Italian pronunciation. Maybe I'm not sure if this pronunciation is perfect or not. Uh, also, Condensi from CNRS uh, Paris, France. Uh, he also got the Marie Curie fellow. Uh, fellowship. So he, it is one of the uh, prestigious fellowship. Uh, he got it and uh, at the Institute of Electronic Structure and Laser uh, Foundation of Research and Technology, um, Heracline Crete, Greece. He also got the JSPS Fellowship uh, uh, from 2009 to 2011 from Kyoto University, Kyoto, Japan. Uh, he also worked as an assistant professor from 2011 to 12 in Kyoto University, Kyoto, Japan. Uh, he was the visiting professor at Kyo University, Yokohama, Japan in 2014 to 15. Uh, he also visited as a JSPS Bridge Fellow in 2017. Also, he has worked as a visiting professor at Kyo University, Yokohama, Japan in 2017 and 2018. Uh, he completed many research projects. Uh, one of uh, two of them are international research project supported by DST under the Indian Japan Science Pro, uh, Cooperation Program in 2013 and 15. Also got the BRNS uh, funded research project in 2014 to 2017. Uh, he has the international research project supported by DST under the Indian Egypt Science Cooperation Program from 2016 to 18. Uh, he is guiding many of the master, young phil and PhD students. Uh, currently, he has uh, guided 20 MSc students, uh, two MPhil students, and six uh, PhD students. Uh, he has two patents uh, uh, with him. Uh, he has uh, uh, granted uh, two uh, patents. Uh, he has more than 50 international publications. He has three book chapters and he attended more than 35 uh, international conferences. Uh, he has also has the membership of academic bodies like uh, associated with the member of uh, Institute of Physics London, uh, the Japanese Society of Applied Physics, member of Indian JSPS Alumina Association, member of Indian Association of Physics Teachers, member of Materials Research Society of India, MRSI, and he has visited many countries like USA, Japan, France, Switzerland, Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Egypt, Poland, Thailand, Malaysia, and many. So with this uh, excellent uh, uh, biodata, I, uh, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Sivaji Sadre, sir, uh, to please uh, start his uh, invited talk. Uh, please share uh, your screen. Uh, uh, and start the your invited talk, please, uh, Mr. Uh, Doctor Yes B Sadre sir. Doctor, okay, uh, Sadre sir is okay. Uh, maybe a little connection problem. Uh, he is uh, joining uh, shortly, so please uh, wait for. Uh, him to join. So actually, he was joined, uh, but uh, as soon as he clicked somewhere, um, he went out of the Zoom meeting. So yeah, he will join. So please, please wait. Okay, uh, please uh, wait for uh, a short time. Uh, Sadhvi sir is joining, so maybe maybe because of the connection issue. Uh, currently in um, uh, Maharashtra, mainly the connection issue is uh, um, at peak, and uh, 
the internet connectivity is um, losing so we are experiencing uh, uh, the uh, internet connection uh, issue but we are trying to fix it so I just wait for a little time okay uh, um, um, yeah, uh, he is not uh, still um, uh, joined. So, uh, without killing the time, so I, I must go to the next speaker. Uh, meanwhile, he may join. Uh, so, uh, I, I will consider. Uh, so, I asked Devan sir. Uh, Devan sir, can you listen me? Okay, uh, Sadra sir has joined. Okay, Sadra sir has joined. So I'm making a co-host to him. Uh, Dr. Sadra. Yeah, uh, good, good morning to yeah. everyone. Uh -huh. Good morning, sir. Uh, so would you please uh, share the screen and uh, please start your invited talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I request, I request all the participants to. Um, let, 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 let me check once uh, the sharing is okay, then uh, I might go for a video also. Okay, okay. Uh, because presently, I think there is some yeah, yeah, yeah. problem. Yeah, if, so, the, if it uh, um, uh, abstract the uh, network, so please don't start your video so that uh, your. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have chosen. Yes, yes, so yes. I can see your screen. Yeah, you can uh, see the slides. Uh, yes, but uh, just make it full screen so that uh, we will. Uh, oh, oh, just a minute. So I'm making a slide show. Yes. So my voice and uh, screen is okay? Yeah, it is perfect, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, very good morning to all of you. Thank you, the organizers, uh, Dr. Latte, principal of uh, Dr. Latte, convener of this. Uh, conference and also the principal of uh, the, the college for giving me the opportunity to share my work and some of our recent results. So uh, congratulations also for organizing this conference online and that is consecutively for the uh, last six years. So the title of my talk is gas phase photocatalysis towards realization of photocatalytic applications. You can see that this is some of uh, one of our cover page published with the Journal of uh, Vacuum Science and Technology B. We have nanotube arrays and on that top up we have some metal nanoparticles. So, you know, most of the applications of the photocatalysis, they are in the, in the gas phase. Uh, let's see how, how photocatalysis work together. It's nothing but it's we are trying to mimic the nature, uh, like the photosynthesis process that happens with the plants or leaves. Photocatalyst works in a similar way. It harnesses the light, solar light, and then you have the electron and hole pair. By using that electron and hole pair, you can use it for various applications. Maybe one of the major application is uh, degradation of an organic uh, pollutant. Okay, and uh, converting that pollutant into harmless uh, entities like uh, water and CO2, which can be captured and used for some other purpose. So this is uh, most of the audience, I guess, is familiar with this fundamentals of the photocatalysis. So I'll move forward. So there are so many applications, okay, of the photocatalyst, uh, starting from 
refrigerations to air cleaning services to window blinds and materials for interior and floors, uh, interior fluorescent lamps paints tiles because most of the organic matter being you no know, it, it's very sticky and smelling uh, all the time in the kitchen so nowadays uh, people are looking for an application so you can see most of these applications uh, of course hydrogen production is one of the application and most of these applications they are in gas phase so that's why uh, we are interested to study and find out the efficiency and the reaction mechanism of photocatalysis in gas phase we know that on the contrary liquid phase studies uh, there are a lot and uh, Uh, but liquid phase photocatalysis is a rate limiting process so inhibiting the rate of hydrogen production hydrogen is uh, no one of the future fuel or next economy it is being said that next economy will be hydrogen economy so on and so and uh, there are some of the characteristics of the the hydrogen that can be used as the best fuel presently it is being used in the in the rockets okay or for the space applications and so you can see that uh, it burns without any without producing any further pollutants so that's why it is clean fuel as non polluting fuel as well as uh, can be made available from the natural uh, resources so hydrogen fuel could be a fuel to the next economy where sustainability is to be taken into account so th- just to give you an idea that uh, the as i cited uh, earlier that most of the applications of photocatalyst are in in the gas phase this present application you can see there are some uh, real estate buildings and uh, these are getting de- uh, degraded uh, with respect to time getting oxidized or maybe some pollutants are being deposited so it has been tested that you can apply a photocatalyst on these tiles and uh, then you can see that it will be a self cleaning wall rather so lot of work is being done into this direction so why we are interested into photo uh, gas phase photocatalysis is major important applications of photocatalysis are in a gas phase gas phase allows to have more insights in the fundamentals of photocatalytic reactions photocatalytic efficiency is expected higher in gas phase for example uh, hydrogen production air cleaning etc so what are the challenges though these are uh, very promising applications for the photocatalysis but what are the challenges are there before we make inroads into the realization of direct applications so the challenges in this heterogeneous photocatalysis are activity of a photocatalyst spectral sensitivity of the photocatalyst and selectivity of the photocatalyst these needs to be studied so a heterogeneous uh, photocatalysis can be no there are presently two different ways uh, for the reaction to happen one of the that is called as direct photo holes or direct hole transfer reaction in this case the conduction it is being also recognized as a conduction band band mechanism where electron is directly utilized uh, okay so electron injection into an electrolyte and peroxide formation so this reaction direct hole transfer reaction uh, proceeds through electron index injection into conduction band and peroxide formation whereas the indirect hole transfer in which the hole is being consumed that too through valence band and is being called as valence band mechanism hole injection into valence band and then you have a oh radical and this proceeds via superoxide formation so this is being called as a protonation of a superox- superoxide okay it's indirect hole transfer reaction so these are two predominant reaction mechanism that happens uh, during the the initial phase of a photocatalysis and that determines the the rate efficiency 
and many other parameters related to the process of photocatalysis. So in developing a, a material, it's a principal challenge is to develop a novel material that can drive photocatalytic efficiency of over 10% in gas phase using solar light, which is the level at which the technology will be made economically viable. So when we are developing some material systems or developing a device, we have to think of making that technology economically viable. And this is what we are targeting towards. So we have tested a couple of, we have developed, synthesized a couple of metal oxides and other materials systems, and we have checked their performance. For example, we have done with the photocatalysis with W3 films and platinum loaded W3 thin films. We have also done a composite of W3 and TiO2. A comparison between platinum loaded W3 TiO2 composite film. We have also carried out a photocatalysis with hematite iron oxide nanotubes with uh, cupric oxide nanoparticles coated on that. Whatever image you have seen is, is with this uh, affinities. So we have deposited uh, W3 thin films by uh, polymer assisted deposition, W3, which was later annealed and confirmed by this XRD. So you get different morphologies. Uh, it, it has been with a different concentration of the pages. So that has been, you can get a nano, you can really tailor the, 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 the morphology of, of a W3 thin film with, uh, with quantitative PEG. So we can, we succeeded in getting fine nanoparticles, okay, of W3 at 20% PEG. And you can see that this AFM and uh, time image, they confirm the synthesis of W3 nanoparticles. We have also made a TiO2 gel solution, and then this is a known process. We have carried out a deposition of a composite film, and uh, we could have very small TiO2 nanoparticles. And really, we have the composite, which has been confirmed by XRD. On the top of that, uh, we have deposited uh, platinum particles by photo electro reduction method. And then this different samples, they were uh, analyzed in a chamber, which is equipped, connected with a, with a QMS, okay, quadrupole mass uh, spectrometer, uh, through, connected through a turbo molecular pump and has a window, cords window, through which we can sustain the light and, and uh, we can also introduce gases, methanol, some other gases so that uh, it can be tested. So we can really control the ambient and you can measure uh, what are the species, gas species that are being developed and uh, by measuring the partial pressures of these species. So initially this chamber was evacuated to very high pressure like 10 to 9 into 10 to minus 7 tor, and then uh, methanol was slowly introduced to a, a, a certain amount, and then uh, that was being partial pressure of methanol was also measured, and then you shine UV light or visible light as per the requirement, and then you measure the partial pressures of different species that are being developed, and by analyzing them, you can get so we, as I commented earlier, there are two mechanisms, direct hole transfer and indirect hole transfer. That was in general. Now let's see what happens to them uh, in case of a methanol. So if the photocatalysis happens via direct hole transfer, then this methanol will get consumed into formaldehyde and you'll get one proton. And this formaldehyde will again get into CH2O, you'll get one more proton and so So two protons are being produced in the direct hole transfer. Whereas in indirect hole transfer, you are getting uh, OH radical and uh, that OH radical will, will be breaking down this 
methanol into formaldehyde producing one hydrogen uh, H2O water molecule followed by again this second uh, formaldehyde will consume one more OH radical and will give you one more water molecule. So you can see that uh, water is a byproduct in an indirect hole transfer reaction whereas water is not being produced in case of a direct hole transfer reaction. So this we have used as an Okay. So overall process of methanol decomposition is a complex convolution of elementary steps that involve several organic intermediates like formaldehyde, CO2, etc. So we'll go through these results and see. For a direct hole transfer reaction, which was observed for in case of methanol with W3, you can see that W3 is getting intercalated with H plus ions. So you will have a blue coloration because of the intercalation. Okay, as you can see that in earlier slide, there was only H plus. Those protons, those can be intercalated here. And you will, without any a platinum in absence of platinum you'll see or without methanol no coloration was observed that means this proton which is being intercalated is generated through direct hole transfer reaction so this is the variation in the partial pressure of, of methanol you can see the partial pressure of variation in partial pressure of h2 as to the uh, the switching of uh, light So this is change in partial pressure of CO2. You can see initially there was a surge in the partial pressure of CO2 once we switch on. That was, uh, and later on you can see the concurrent absorption decomposition of, uh, of uh, so this A region is, is a little bit of uh, phenomenon that is happening in the beginning. Okay. So that can be replenished. So we have done some control experiment to find out why it is so. So that is because of the photoinduced desorption. So in absence of oxygen, the, the, the photoinduced desorption is very profound. And that's why, because this process is being carried out in a, in a vacuum and uh, there is not much oxygen. So that's why the photoinduced desorption is quite high in the beginning. Now let's uh, see what are the results with the composite. With the composite, uh, we have clear variation in the par partial pressures of formaldehyde as well as partial pressures of CO2 and CO. You can see the, the, the variation in the partial pressure of H2, which is uh, in line with this UA on. Okay, so once light is being switched on, the, the H2 is being produced and uh, that's why you can see the rise in the partial pressure of H2. And that is in case of W3TiO2, the percentage of uh, composite is with 10% TiO2. And the most interesting thing is uh, with only 2% of TiO2, you can see a linear increase in the partial pressures of H2. Whereas uh, only with W3, you don't see any rise in the partial pressure of uh, water. Okay, partial pressure of water. But in case of uh, a composite film with 10% TiO2, you can see a clear switching in the partial pressure of water along in line with this uh, UEA on off. That means in case of composite films with uh, W3 and TiO2 with 10% TiO2, the reaction proceeds via indirect hole transfer where you get three molecules of water as a byproduct. If the reaction proceeds via direct hole transfer, then in that case, water is not being produced. 
as to the case of W3, you can see there is no rise in the partial pressure of water in case of W3. With just 2% of TiO2, we get a linear increase in the water. That means TiO2 is inducing and change in the reaction pathway. So from direct hole transfer to indirect hole transfer. This is only with TiO2. So appendages we have done with the, uh, the we have for appendages and uh, CNPs, we have tested the, the photocatalysis with, uh, with gas chromatograph. And this is the, the schematic uh, present representation of the, the whole setup. The same chamber was being used. Only thing is, instead of connecting it to a quadruple mass spectrometer, we have connected it to the gas chromatographer. So we have synthesized uh, uh, FNT nanotubes. You can, this is the top view, and then you have this columnar structure, and uh, you can see this cross-sectional view. On the top of that, we have deposited CNPs. You can see these are there, and this was being confirmed by XRD, out of plane XRD profile of FNTs loaded with CNPs. So you can see a uh, time, a flight time in column and uh, with zero hours to, to six hours, gradually it got increased. So variation in the gas chromatographic profile of H2 peaks. This is the variation of H2 peaks and then amount of H2 produced with the gas phase photocatalysis versus duration of visible light irradiation for FNT CNP. You can see it, it goes up, but with FNT platinum or only with FNT or only with CNP, you don't see any H2 production. So hydrogen was not being produced uh, for even for four hours or so, in addition of four hours or so. But with FNT CNP, you can see there is a steep rise in the hydrogen. So this was the flow through reactor being utilized and uh, you can see the samples being and so this is the side view and this is the top view of this. So the gases are being made to circulate around. Okay, this is the design that has been, this was designed and fabricated by us, the flow through reactor. So in conclusions, the reaction intermediates such as CH2, CO, formaldehyde, CO and CO2 were successfully detected with real-time measurements. So that helped us in the identification of the intermediate products and, and uh, helped us in defining the reaction path or identifying the reaction path. In case of decomposition of methanol or W3 thin films, direct hole transfer was dominating and intercalation of released photons was observed, causing the color change of the films from transparent to blue. And in that case, hydrogen was not produced. With addition of TiO2, the decomposition of methanol occurs via competitive indirect and direct hole transfer. Hydrogen was produced only with the platinum loaded W3 and W3 TiO2 composite films, and only with appendage CNP. Um, uh, material systems, not with uh, the platinum and FNTs are not with uh, only FNTs or only CNPs. So these are the, the, the major conclusions and uh, still more work is going on in, in, in these directions. So I'll be happy to take up some questions if they are there. Um, so. uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Yes, B. Sadres for uh, uh, your innovative talk uh, on gas phase photocatalysis uh, towards realization of photocatalytic uh, applications. Um, this was a, a, an informative uh, lecture and uh, I got few questions in the chat box and I'm reading it. Uh, I hope uh, you will uh, entertain uh, those questions. So the first question is asked by Dr. Vijay Savan. He's asking whether gas phase photocatalyst can be used for atmospheric pollutant degradation yeah it, it can be used but it has to be you know immobilized onto some surfaces 
where atmosphere comes services. to the picture. Yeah. Otherwise, no, it will uh, get to lose. Uh, in, in, we will release that material itself into uh, atmosphere. So it has to be immobile on any of the surfaces where uh, uh, atmosphere or the pollutant, atmospheric pollutants, they are coming into contact. For example, kitchen tiles. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly we get a lot of odor even after the next two days or three days. You cook something and those are the rather organic uh, pollutants. But if you have tiles mounted there, definitely we have light there. Mm -hmm. If you have photoactive, uh, visible light, uh, active photocatalyst coated on the tiles, then uh, mostly that will work there. Mm -hmm. And for the, in case of the air purification, uh, so the surface should be the porous surface like membranes? Uh, not necessarily for, uh, this is required only for the flow through reactors or where you want to have. Otherwise, uh -huh. it can just be a plain surface, uh, but having a particle size smaller can increase mm -hmm. your surface area. And that's how you can go with the higher efficiency rather than going for a porous material. Uh, now, now uh, in, in recent times, there are advertisements coming uh, while buying the air conditions uh, that they are having the antibacterial coating inside the uh, the filters, I, I don't know much about it, but uh, uh, they are advertising like this. So it is closely related to you and uh, like that. Yeah, uh, these are uh, the new applications that are coming with, mm -hmm. uh, but still uh, no, uh, has to be tested for more longer time. I see, I see. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, Dr. Mahendra Kaule from Sangmeshwar College, Solapur, he is asking, Professor Sadri, sir, uh, how the photosensitivity is measured? Uh, can you repeat? Uh, he is asking how the photosensitivity is measured. Okay, photosensitivity was measured by one one response was with this uh, measuring the intensity of light. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, see how much uh, reaction products you got. Mm -hmm. That is what has been done with the appendix uh, CNP. We, we have a irradiation time and uh, a fixed wavelength was used and accordingly you can find out the quantum yield and that's how we have. Uh, you can use uh, by finding the quantum yields, by measuring the quantum yields, you can find out the sensitivity towards mm -hmm. each wavelength. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and it seems that most of the work you have done in the, uh, I, I know you have the collaboration in Egypt and uh, uh, Italy, but uh, most of the work is Japan. the Japan. So you are missing Japan and when you are visiting to Japan. <laughs> uh, now you are also aware of the situation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, hope that uh, we will get the situation clear in a couple of months or so, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the world will be once again free. Yes. So I, I request all of you to take care in this uh, very hard times of the humanity. Yes. yes. Uh, so, uh, so thanks once again for your excellent talk. Your research work is uh, really very good. Uh, 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 your references are uh, uh, quite followed and the citation index uh, uh, of yours are uh, increasing. So congratulations once again and thanks for your... Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And See you. Best. See you, sir. See you. Bye. Uh, so, uh, we have our uh, next speaker. So, our next speaker is <clears throat> uh, Dr. Rupesh uh, Devan, sir. So, Dr. Rupesh Devan has completed his bachelor degree in 1999 to 2002. Uh, he also completed his master degree in 2004. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD in 2007. So, all his bachelor, master and PhD degrees uh, he completed from Sivaji University, Kolapur. Uh, currently, he is an associate professor since uh, December 2018 at the Department of Metallurgy, Engineering and Material Science, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Indore uh, in India. Uh, so uh, he actually the editor of uh, Chinese Journal of Physics uh, since 2018. Uh, he has uh, held many positions. Uh, one of them is uh, he has completed the INSPIRE Faculty Fellowship 
uh, given by the uh, Department of Science and Technology, New Delhi. Uh, he completed uh, Inspire Faculty uh, uh, project uh, from 2014 to 2019. Uh, he worked as an assistant professor from 2017 to 18 at uh, Department of MEMS uh, IIT Indore. Uh, he is uh, also he was also associate professor from 2016 to 17 uh, at the Central University of Punjab, uh, Batinda. Uh, he joined as a Inspire faculty fellow uh, from 2014 to 2016 at Department of Physics, Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University, Pune. Uh, he also joined as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, for a long time, 2007 to 2013, almost six to seven years at National Donghua University, Taiwan. Uh, he also worked as a teaching assistant uh, from 2005 to seven in the Department of Physics, uh, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Uh, with this uh, short introduction, um, I welcome Dr. Uh, Rupesh Devan, sir, uh, 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 in the sixth international conference on advances in material science. Uh, now I request um, uh, Dr. Rupesh Devan sir to please uh, uh, share your uh, presentation and uh, uh, deliver the invited talk. Uh, thank you Sanjay uh, for uh, inviting me to this conference <clears throat> uh, because I learned that you have arranged a uh, lot of conferences on this yes. track and this is the sixth. So first of all, congratulate, yes. congratulations. Thanks. 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 You know, it's a tough time for everyone. So I can see a uh, few of my friends, few uh, student friends as well, few of my seniors on board. Sorry, that means we are talking about energy storage. So that's the reason I have selected here the topic, uh, heteroarchitecture materials for display and energy storage. So now I not need to explain why displays and uh, energy storage are more important uh, in a present scenario. So as I mentioned, displays are uh, become an important part of our life. Uh, few of us knows that we have seen black TV and then it has converted into a color screen. So earlier it was even a uh, big size, so which was lying at corner and now it has moved to a uh, wall of your hall. But most important thing uh, is it has become even smaller it coming in your pocket. So that means you, I'm talking about the cell phone or pad, uh, most probably iPad, or you can use a Samsung pad or HTC pad. So nowadays we are even thinking of converting these pocket uh, based displays into flexible displays though, so that we can fold it and we can carry anywhere. And then we can serve the purpose. That means you can attend the conferences online or you can watch TV online, or even uh, you can do your businesses online. So, that's what's happening now. So if you look at actual development happening with this, uh, can you see my slides moving? Uh, yes, sir, it is perfect, no problem. Okay, so if you look at the uh, massive wealth creation with this technology then started quite long back earlier is with textile road, uh, railroad as an auto automobiles. Most of our generations uh, have not seen this massive wealth creation with this textile railroad and automobile. But what we have seen is a computer and what we are going to see is a nanotechnology. So Google has introduced to driverless car. That means- so the